morning. Welcome to the 2019 Cigarera Family Medical STEM Lecture. This lecture was established in 2017. The Cigarera Distinguished Lecture spotlights a prominent scholars or leaders in a medical or science discipline. The lecture is named in honor of the Cigarera family of Laredo, Texas, and its three generations of medical doctors and active leaders who have served in their communities and in national organizations. This lecture features established leaders and icons in the medical and science professions. The bios of Dr. Francisco Cigarroa and Dr. Olivia Grave are on the programs. I am sharing with you some of the great achievements of each one of them. Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Cigarroa, a third generation physician, was born in Laredo, Texas, as one of the 10 children. Dr. Cigarroa earned his medical degree in 1983 from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas. In 2009, Dr. Cigarroa became the first Hispanic to be named Chancellor of the University of Texas. Now, I am sharing with you some of the great achievements of Dr. Olivia Grave. Thank you for being here, Dr. Grave. Dr. Grave joined the University of California, San Diego in 2012, and she is currently professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace. My goodness, what is this? <laughs> oh, again. <laughs> Tenemos que estar orgullosos de las personas como nuestra paisana, doctora Olivia Grave. Professor Gra Grave has received research grants from different federal agencies such as the National Foundation. Her publication focuses both research and pedagogy and curriculum development contributions with publications on the Journal of the American Ceramic Society, the Journal of Physical Chemistry. My goodness, did you see that? This is fantastic. This is the Journal of Applied Physics, and among others. Professor Grave has contributed to the development of human resources, both as a research advisor and as an instructor, teaching courses in the general areas of structure. She has been involved in many such as retention of women and Hispanic students in science. She has received several prestigious awards. More recently, she has been inducted into the Tijuana Walk of Fame and the Mexican Academy of Engineering. And she has been named Fellow of the American Ceramic Society. In addition, Forbes magazine named her on the one of the one one of the the one hundred most powerful women of Mexico. <laughs> please, please join me in welcoming Professor Olivia Grab. Thank you, uh, thank you, Carmen, for that invitation, and thank you all of you for being here. It's early in the morning. I uh, 
I appreciate you getting up and, and being here for my, for my remarks. I am um, certainly flattered and excited to be here with you today. I, um, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a, I say, a lover of education. I love my job. I, I, I love teaching. I love research. And uh, one of the things that I love the most when I get asked about uh, what, what do I like about my job is that my coworkers are always 18. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, they're 18, and then uh, the next year they're 18 again, and the next year they're 18 again. It's, it's a miracle, I swear. <laughs> they never age. And so uh, when I think about science and engineering and my trajectory in science and engineering, it goes back actually to, um, to my junior high school where I had a wonderful chemistry teacher. And this is a periodic table of the elements. Everyone has taken high school chemistry, right? Yes. So this, one, this is one of those things. Um, some of you may not remember the intricacies of the periodic table, but everyone has seen the periodic table and has taken chemistry in high school, at least probably in college as well. This is the international year of the periodic table, by the way. Uh, so it was uh, announced by the United Nations. The United Nations decided this is the international year of the periodic table because it turned 150 years old. And so we, I love the periodic table. It basically defines my job as a scientist in materials engineering and mechanical engineering. What I do in my research is I look at the periodic table and I look at the elements in the periodic table and I start mixing them up. And in this mixing process, I come up with new, interesting, new compositions of materials. And I love doing that. And so uh, I consider myself, I'm an engineer, but I kind of consider myself like almost an applied chemist because it's like thinking about the periodic table and doing something with the periodic table. And so this being the International Year of the Periodic Table, I would encourage you to buy one, put it in front of the wall of your bed, and when you wake up in the morning, that's the first thing you see. And you say, wow, that is what the universe is made of. That's spectacular. So I encourage you to do that. Buy one, please. And so when I think about mixing elements of the periodic table, um, I come up with compositions that are fairly complex. I don't know how, how well you can see what's on the screen, but there at the top, there is this one composition, new material, that was developed in my laboratory. We have a patent for this. Um, it contains, oh, who remembers the symbols of the periodic table? Iron and chromium, molybdenum, manganese, tungsten, boron, carbon, and silicon. All right, very good. Yes. So this graph that you see in this slide is a measurement of the mechanical properties of this alloy. This is a metallic alloy. And that value that you see there in that box in bold, 12.4, that's gigapascals, is actually a record for all metallic materials. There are a few ceramics that exceed this. But this is a record material. It really is outstanding in what sense? It actually has an amazing impact resistance, record impact resistance for metallic materials. And so in my lab, I think a lot about the periodic table. I think about the elements. And we come up with these things. And we want to obviously improve behavior. And in this case, it's impact resistance. So this material, you hit it with anything, it just doesn't bend. And, uh, and it doesn't shatter. And so we are getting to the point, I would hope, I think, maybe not, where we're developing materials that can approach this. <laughs> that is, yes, yeah, so we're making, we're making, we think we're making vibranium, I just don't know. Everyone knows what this is, right? <laughs> Yeah, ever, I think the, 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 the marble has become very popular in the last decade or so. 
And so um, Captain America, he's awesome and very cute. So um, uh, that's where we're approaching, uh, we're approaching this thing. That's what we do in my lab. But also, when I think about my own trajectory as a scientist and an engineer, I think of the, of the feelings of, of loneliness. I certainly was the only Latina PhD student at, at, uh, at my PhD institution when I was there in engineering. Not the only Latina PhD student, but in engineering, I was the only one. And, um, and so that was in 1995, 1996 when I started. And the idea there was, all right, let me just sort of try this out, right? I was pretty good with that um, because, I mean, anybody that goes into engineering has generally the background of somebody that was sort of good in math and science in junior high and high school. Quite common. Why did you get into engineering? Oh, well, I was good in math, and so somebody in my high school told me that I should maybe become an engineer. And so that's, that's sort of what happened with me. I, I was good with the math, and I was good with the chemistry, and so there I go. And um, I started thinking about where were we? Where are all the Latino engineering students? At that time, I was thinking of PhD students. I wasn't thinking faculty because I, I hadn't even, that hadn't even occurred to me yet. But, uh, and so we started building programs as a cohort of PhD students started building programs for promoting graduate education uh, through the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineering, an organization I've been a member of for 30 years. And so when we started coming together, we started building a cohort that became very active. And so then the goal was, let us not just stop at the PhD level, let us actually promote the professoriate. And so we started building this graduate institute and some, um, some other programs that have been very successful at doing that. And so at some point, uh, I decided I was gonna become a faculty member, and I did. And I decided, well, let us, uh, for these programs that we built for the SHIP organization, let's start bringing in Latino faculty that can serve as mentors for the PhD students and master's students that we were promoting, that, that we were helping somehow through these workshops. And, and so a lot of co-curricular activity, basically, what was, it was happening. And so what ended up happening was that I started looking for them. And I started finding them. And at some point, the list became very interesting. Uh, it, there was one particular conference, uh, I can't remember what year that was, but it must have been probably 2005 or so, maybe a little later, where we had uh, over 200 Latino engineering faculty at the national meeting, at the national conference. And, and so one of the professors, uh, uh, Ray uh, Arroyave, who's a faculty at Texas A&M, he tells me, you know, Olivia, what you're doing is very dangerous. What? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you know, if a bomb falls in this room uh, now, it's like gonna wipe out all of us. He's like, there's gonna be none left. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> so when it became very interesting, I started thinking, all right, I have to put an effort into finding all of them. Where are they? Who are they all? I knew I hadn't reached out to all of them. So we needed to go through websites and start really systematically finding all the Latino engineering faculty. And we did. And last year, I published a paper on this. So this is a, this is a published paper in the uh, MRS bulletin. You can, you can find it. The citation is there at the top. I know it's probably difficult to see. But so when you look at those numbers, uh, see, I can't even see it from here. And I don't, I don't have the... Um, I can give you just a few uh, general statistics rega regarding this. There are close to 700 of us in the whole country. Okay. And um, so the top, the green, the green are the totals, and they are divided by assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. Um, so the numbers of full professors are higher because full professor is a terminal position the assistant professors eventually become associate professors, and then everyone gets clustered at the top, and then that's it, right? That's what you are. And so if you look at the curve in green, at the, at the, uh, at the curves in green, or the, the bars in green, that's all, women and men. And then the middle one, which is blue, is uh, the, the men. 
And so uh, men follow the same trend as the general population. And, and so that would make sense because in fact, they are the great majority of, uh, of Latino engineering faculty. Uh, and so assistant, associate, and full. I should mention that these statistics are now outdated because this was published just last year. And already this fall, there was several uh, new assistant professors that got hired at several different universities. And so I know that they're there. I just haven't been following up. And so if you look at the very bottom, which is in pink, those are the women faculty. And what is interesting is that, in fact, that does not follow the general trend. Instead of being uh, higher numbers at the full professor level, where we presumably all get clustered, the number of women Latina engineering faculty is lower at the full professor level than it is at the assistant at the associate. And so we have an issue with respect to gender and engineering for sure, and I don't think I have to convince any of you of this. I'm sure you're, w you're well aware. Um, you may not have been knowing the numbers, but there are not that many Latina engineers. And so um, at UCSD, I was hired there in 2012, I was the first Latina engineering professor ever to be hired at UC San Diego. And this is the 21st century. So, uh, well, thank you. When we, when we think about the top 20 schools of engineering in the United States, some have none and some have one. And UCSD has two because there's two of us now. So, um, so we're pretty good. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> I, um, I think very carefully about these numbers and the idea is we need to change them and we need to improve them. And so uh, one of the things that, that I decided to do was to uh, build um, a research center at UC San Diego that really promoted cross-border uh, relationships. I am from Mexico, I am from Tijuana, and so, thank you. And so, um, the collaboration with Mexico was very important to me as a, as, as a Mexicana. And, uh, and so I, I, I founded uh, this center called the Calibaja Center for Resilient Materials and Systems. So the focus is, is material science in terms of the science itself. But there are a lot of faculty in this center that are not in, scientists and engineers. We have a visual artist, we have an economics person, we have a music person. Um, and visual arts, I said. So uh, they're all the, Mex the Mexican professors at UCSD. Because when I arrived at UCSD, I was like, I was doing the same thing that I did when I was a graduate student. Where are they? And I started looking for the Mexicanos and for the Latinos in general. But uh, at first, I wanted to start with the Mexicanos. And so I, I found them on our campus. There's about 20 of us across the entire campus, School of Medicine, everything. and. Um, and so we couldn't very well build the, uh, the center of the Mexican professors at UCSD. Did, didn't kind of didn't make sense. And so we started thinking about a thema thematic uh, area. And that's how the Calibaja Center came about. And we focus in the science on materials in extreme environments, which is, of course, my area of research. We want to build materials that can withstand all kinds of very extreme environments. Eventually, we're going to make it to Mars. We want to build materials for Mars. That, that, that is meant to represent Mars with the, you know, the orange dirt. No, we have not been there. That, um, that female astronaut is, uh, is not, uh, it's not really there. And so the center itself is not just about the science, but it has a lot of outreach programs. And so we want to break barriers. We want to build bridges. In fact, I, I, I'm a strong believer in times, in times of crisis, the wise build bridges and the foolish build barriers. And <laughs> we, thank you. We'd, we'd like to think in the Calibaja Center that we're, that we're kind of wise. And so we're, we're building bridges. And so one of the things that I did and that we did in the center with s several different colleagues was to establish an outreach program for um, students from both sides of the border. And so the, um, the program that we built is called Enlace or Enlace. So you can say it in both Spanish and English. It means the same thing. 
And it means something, it's very fortuitous, that it's like the same word in Spanish and English. It means to join. And so, and so um, the program was started in 2013. Uh, indeed, I, I started the program in that year uh, with five students, five high school students from Tijuana. 17-year-olds, uh, they come to campus and they spend a summer at UCSD, summer undergraduate research, uh, not undergraduate, high school research. So they join a, a research lab, seven weeks, they live in the dorms, and the idea is for them to start thinking that college is just a way station, and where they're going is the PhDs. And, uh, and so the idea from the very beginning was not to just have students from Tijuana in the program. I started with Tijuana students because there's all kinds of complexities associated with minors in laboratories that are from a different country. <laughs> very difficult. And so um, next year, the, the whole vision came together because the goal with this program is that we're going to bring students into the summer at UCSD from both sides of the border. Latinos from the United States, started in San Diego, of course, and then Mexican students from, the, from Baja California. And we're gonna put them in laboratories in pairs, one from each side of the border. So, thank you, yes. It's a good idea, I think. The, uh, the, uh, the, in times of crisis, the wise build bridges, the, the foolish build barriers. We're, we're eliminating barriers, we're eliminating walls, and we're building human bridges. And so here are these kids, 17 year olds, still high school program. The first four years was only high school. Eventually it became also college. And so now in this summer is seventh year of the program. We have a cohort of, of high schoolers and a cohort of undergraduates. And so last summer the program was 104 students in the program. So it grew from five to 19 to 26 to 70 to 100 to 104. This coming summer, I'm expecting 130 students in the program. This picture over here is a picture of this, of this, of this past year when I had 104 students. And uh, that kid in the picture on the left, his name is Luis Gallegos. He plays the guitar, the piano, and the bass. And um, this was one of the lectures that we have on Monday mornings for during the serving weeks of the program. It's called, uh, the, I call them science and society lectures. And so the Science and Society lecture of the fin a final week of the program last year was actually that guy in the back, um, African-American. His name is Nathan East. He is the bass for Eric Clapton. And because Luis plays the guitar, Luis played the guitar and, and Nathan played uh, the bass and they played Tears in Heaven. And it was something special. Um, everyone was crying. I think very strongly and very definitively about the concept of friendships at a young age. 17 year olds, when you are a friend at 17, at 15, at 14, those are your most honest, pure friendships you will ever have your whole life because they are based on the fact that you like each other. There is nothing else complicating the relationship. I think when, we're all, when we become adults, everything gets more complicated in life. But when you are 17, you just like each other. Nothing else matters. And so here we are thinking, OK, let us, um, let us think about, and I tell my students, let us think about you all. Here you are, the future president of Mexico, now, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, call him Jose, and the, and the future president of the United States, and I, I'd like to call him Jose also. Jose and Jose, and you've known each other since you were 17 years old. That changes the equation. It reduces barriers, it eliminates barriers. It's beautiful. I, I actually would like, I, I like to say now that it's a, maybe uh, it's more like Maria and a young Michelle Obama. That would be awesome. So when, um, and, and that's what we're thinking of. That's what we're building here at UCSD. And so that's a picture of my family, um, my mom, uh, everything I am. I owe to my darling mother. 
And the picture on the right is my three sisters and me. I'm the tallest because I'm the oldest. And so, um, Lisi, so me, you, you heard, I, I have a, you know, my degrees and such. Lisi, who's next one in height over there in that picture, uh, she is a double major in, uh, in political science and Latin American studies from UCLA and a master's in public policy from uh, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And Romina, the next one, is uh, uh, an environmental chemist, UC San Diego. And, uh, and she's in charge of all of the um, Tijuana, San Diego pollution issues stuff on the San Diego side. And then Melina, the youngest one there, is a chef. She doesn't have an undergraduate degree. She, she went to, she's the one that makes the most money out of everyone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, no, no degree. And, and the one not, uh, not pictured, because yes, he hadn't been born yet, is my little brother, Enrique Kiki. He is an electrical engineer from UCLA. And so everything we are, we owe to our darling mother. And I think family. Family defines us as Latinos, I think. Um, and it certainly has defined my own family. And so I am very much a, a, a Star Trek fan. I am a scientist after all. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Sephram Cochran, the inventor of warp drive. Star Trek, any Trekkies? Uh, I don't know. And uh, this picture is from, um, from First Contact with, uh, with, with the Vulcans. Good enough. Uh, I am very much a believer that we will live long and we will prosper as a community. Very Vulcan, sure. Um, I, I have hope, actually. I think that we need to fill ourselves with hope. We have this negative rhetoric. We have all of this stuff coming out of Washington. Let us put that aside and build within us this feeling and this heart and this mind full of hope. I have hope for the next generation. I have hope for my students that they are going to define a better future. We have big problems that they actually have to solve. And some of the young students in the room, you have big problems you have to solve. The, the most important one is global warming and climate change. And it is for the young people in the room. It is a problem that you did not create, but it is a problem that you are going to have to solve. And so you need to prepare yourselves and scientists and engineers and education and academics and people that in, in all fields are necessary to, to, to solve this extremely complex problem because it's not just about the science or the engineering of global warming. It's about the politics and the geopolitics of global warming, which is going to define the future of the planet, really. Where are we going as a society and as a world without barriers and without walls, this, or with barriers or with walls, this is going to affect all of us. And so I think building community, formando comunidad, is, uh, is extremely important. And so uh, when, I, um, when I think about the future, and I think about all of the good things that you are doing and the good things that you are going to be doing, Mother Teresa used to say, um, if you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. And so goodness and hope uh, is something that can't be, you can't go around, this is from, from a favorite movie of mine, we can't go around measuring our goodness but by what we don't do or by what we deny ourselves or what we resist or who we exclude. I think we have to measure goodness by what we embrace, what we create, and who we include. And this is a favorite movie of mine, I told you, right? Uh, it's Chocolate. Love that movie. Romantic comedy. Nothing particularly deep about the movie, except I really like this couple of, of things that one of the characters says. 
We've got to measure goodness by what we embrace, what we create, and who we include. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your time, for this honor. I, um, I think that, is there time for questions? Is there, is there a, yes. yes, okay. So thank you very much, open for questions. <laughs> well, that's, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there a microphone somewhere around? One or two questions, and then we'll move on. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question is, how, uh, how did I, um, can I provide details about how I started the, uh, the program, the Enlace program for high school students? Uh, and it seems that, that it would be a, a very significant uh, institutional barrier to implement something like this. Um, perhaps in, uh, in other places, but honestly not at UCSD. Uh, we have a very enlightened leadership at UC San Diego. And um, it, our chancellor is very supportive. He gave me the money for the first year. And he continues to support the program now. And so uh, some of the other leaders of the campus are Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, extremely positive. Our former Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs was here, extremely supportive as well. Um, I have to be careful. There are rules and regulations that need to be followed with minors. And so there are checks and balances with respect to that. But, but I think that as long as, um, as I follow through with those checks and balances, everything is good. And I have been very supportive. Uh, supported by the, uh, in these efforts. And so every time I, I show up with a new and crazy idea, the response I get is, um, yeah, go, go do it. Uh, and so I'm lucky that way. I know that this may not be something that can be expanded into other institutions, perhaps in many, but not all. And I think that it has to do with litigation of minors, right? The, the issue of minors in, a, in laboratories. I think that as the program progresses and success occurs, then success begets more success. And this is why we are now at 130 for next summer. Uh, I think that I have to be with numbers so, so large now, I have to be doubly careful about the minors. They're not all minors anymore, right? They're as undergraduates now. And so there's all kinds of rules I have so first of all, the minors have chaperones that live with them in the dorms. And um, I have all kinds of uh, rules about fraternizing. So you can't show up and leave with a boyfriend. Um, especially because now I have minors and, uh, and adults in the program, right? So they are divided that way and certainly the dorms are very well structured to allow for that to occur in a good way. Um, I, I cannot say that it's been easy, but I feel like I've been supported at it. The one thing that the university didn't even know how to begin to handle was the issue of the visas for the students. It's not that they didn't want to, it's that they had no clue, nor did I. Right? How, how in the world do you do the visas for minors in a university? It was just like a headache. We managed, we, we got it settled. And, and now we know the process. So I think it goes back to the leadership and the support that you have from those leaders. One more. Oh, um, well, Joanne over here. Uh, oh, back there. Thank you very much for your comments. I'm Rebecca Robles Pina, and I'm one of the judges for the outstanding dissertation competition. 
So if uh, tomorrow we will make those awards, but also if next year you're thinking about coming out and participating in the Outstanding Dissertation Committee, please let us know. Anyway, I wanted to ask a question about mentorship because mentorship has been very important to me. Who were your mentors mm -hmm. and what traits did they have as mentors and who are you mentoring? Yes. So um, I, I think that this goes back to, even before the definition of this concept of a mentor, it goes back to my junior high with my chemistry teacher, you know, who was very supportive and, and encouraged me in chemistry. Um, but at the undergraduate level, I did find a female faculty member in engineering. At, I, I did my undergrad at UCSD, by the way. Uh, and, but I lived in Tijuana. And so I crossed the border every day, like many people along the border, they do this. And so the, the back and forth across the border was very exhausting. And, uh, and she was there to support me. Her name is Joanna. She's still a faculty member at UCSD in my department, so we're, we're colleagues now. And, uh, and so there's her. And then, of course, the natural mentor would be my PhD advisor, uh, a very supportive uh, a, a male, a man, um, from Iraq. And, and so his views on, on, on supporting his graduate students were extremely progressive and wonderful. He's a total gentleman and, and I just love him to death. There have been other ones uh, that have become mentors to me and that have supported me. And one of them is Juan Gonzalez here, um, our former BCSA. Uh, and, and so whenever I had an issue, because I'm the director of this center at UCSD for student success in the School of Engineering, and whenever I had a problem, I was like, Juan, you have to help me figure this one out. Um, and so that's, that's really what, where, I, w I would mention those three in particular. There have been, there've been other ones, what are their characteristics? Their characteristics is that they listen, and they don't necessarily have all the answers for you, but they know how to guide the conversation so that perhaps you come up with the solution yourself. And so what I, what I do in my own mentoring is the same. I listen uh, and I try as best as I can and as best as I know to, to guide. Um, I have a large research group, uh, about 20 students. Uh, postdocs, PhDs, there's like what, 15 PhD students or so and then undergraduates. Um, but then, as the director of the IDEA Engineering Student Center, I am supposed to be helping and supporting all engineering students in the School of Engineering at UCSD, which is close to 9,000 students, both graduates and undergrads. And so, um, how do I do that? One person at a time. Uh, I promised myself this year that, uh, you know, too late for the sophomores and the juniors and the seniors, but for the freshman class of UCSD Engineering, which is, uh, I think, about 800. I said, I am going to meet with every single freshman. I don't ever want to hear that they don't know what the Idea Engineering Student Center is. So I'm going through them slowly but surely, and it's like listening to what they have to say and really listening. So that's what I can say. And Hi, thank you for your comments. I'm Beverly Irby from Texas A&M University and I know your friend. Uh, yes. <laughs> and um, also, I, I was just, um, I'm also on the dissertation award committee, review committee, but I'm wondering if you could share with us some ideas of how we might assist the public schools uh, in supporting the students early on in moving in terms of their curriculum and in terms of working with the counselors in moving the particularly the Latinas, uh, into, um, into the STEM areas or in, and into engineering in particular? So I think that the making sure that, that Latinas, Latinos move through the system at the K through 12 level uh, has to do with uh, relevant and appropriate mentors and high touch. Not the, not the, I have a program with 1,000 students and, uh, and I, I'm going to see them five minutes over a three year period. The, the, what, our, what our students need is 
mentors that are really engaged. And so the development of programs that can allow you to have that high touch capability is important. Um, the former students of Enlace, at this point I have close to uh, 400, uh, over 400 alumni in the program, six years, over 400 or so. Uh, we're building that kind of program, high touch of the now graduate students of the, of the Enlace program with high schoolers and with junior high school students. I think in the absence of, of, of somebody that can show you that si se puede, um, it becomes very difficult. When you just don't see it, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody what I'm saying, right? I, I think what we need to do is to think of high touch programs that can promote this. So there are several organizations that I know of that do this. Mana de San Diego, for example, does this very well. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping the Enlace program will do the same. Uh, connecting with the high schools, connecting with the juniors highs, and establishing programs that don't require a lot of money because I think all the mentors are volunteers. Um, that promotes the high touch concept. I think that's what a lot of graduate students, uh, Latino graduate students that I have seen, are interested in helping in this way. They want to help. They just don't know what structure to follow. They're not in a position to actually implement a, or institutionalize a program. So I think it's our responsibility to do that, to institutionalize, to set up for them, and then they will come. And then you can have that high touch concept. That, that's, my, that's my view. Buenos dias, doctora. My name is Corina Benavides Lopez. I'm assistant professor of Chicana Chicano Studies at CSU Dominguez Hills. And my question to you is, um, with the Elance program and other programs that you work with, how do you meet the needs of undocumented students? Yes, uh, so the, the undergraduate uh, and both in the high school program, because I have students from both sides of the border, right? The Mexican students are Mexican students, they're not undocumented. <laughs> they come with a visa. Um, on, the, on, the, on the US side, I have had uh, DACA students in the program it, it is no, I don't think I have to do anything special about that. They are being protected still by the program that we still have in this country and that needs to stay. Um, and so if they have DACA status and they're enrolled in high school, for me it's like it's basically serving, a, it makes no difference to my program. Because on the, on the U.S. side I have students that are citizens, I have students that are permanent residents with green cards, and I have uh, DACA students as well. And the legal aspects of that are handled by the government, right? So it has not hindered anything that I do, and I certainly have had students like that in my program. Mm -hmm. I think we're done, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>